Finding your purpose needs to be the most important mission of your life. You know, I always say, if you're not walking in your purpose, you're just working and living to die. And I hope it shakes people to the core when they hear that. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. Growing up without having an abundance of money and coming from this place of scarcity and poverty, how did you train your mindset to think more of abundance mindset financially around money? How did you change the conversation? or the, the ideas in your mind? How did you learn about money differently? You know, it's funny because I don't know that it ever really changed. You know, I, I always say I still kind of have a poor kid mentality. Really? No matter how successful I've been or how much money I've made, I still have this weird fear of going back. Gosh. So my mindset, it hasn't, it's something I struggle with. It's really? something I'm really working on. You know, I, I talk a lot in interviews about, you know, balancing these two jobs I had. I worked as a sports agent and a lawyer, two separate jobs, not at one company. One was at the number three law firm in the world and one was at a top sports agency. And I did that because of money. And my husband would be like, we're good. You can leave that job. But it was, it was this weird fear. So I would say... You mean you worked double jobs because of money? Because you wanted to make sure you had more, make, enough. Yeah, because being a sports agent costs a lot of money. People it don't does. know that. You're traveling. You've got yeah. expenses. You have to wait for contracts to come in. Do you get your commissions? And then you've got to train the players. And each player could cost you twenty five grand to one hundred mm -hmm. grand, and it comes out of your own pocket. Getting As ready an agent. for the draft. Getting ready yes. for the draft. Yes. Exactly. And so, in order to front that money, I had to have another job. Wow. And so, even when I got to the position where I had, you know, multiple first round picks, and I was doing fine. I still wouldn't leave the job. I wouldn't leave the law job because my mindset about money never changed. You know, it was always in my mind like it was it was something that I was scarce and also something I feel like I had to hoard. Mm. So it even took me a, a, a very long time to get to the point of okay, now I need to invest my money. Even though I have a background in finance, I know you shouldn't hoard your money, but when you grow up poor, I know I felt this for like a decade. It's just it's different, and people would say you know better. Wow. Right? I've got my Series Seven, my Series Sixty Three. I could trade on the stock market. I know better. But you just kept it in safe. And it was like, it's like hiding it under your mattress. <laughs> <laughs> Not doing anything for you. Nothing. Nothing. This is dying for you. Yeah. Isn't it sad? So when did you start to shift and say, okay, I can't hoard this. I need to shift the mindset and actually like invest in myself or invest in, not that you weren't investing in yourself, but investing your money yeah. and being willing to spend some of it to really create more of it. I think it was me just saying, hey, I've got to take a leap of faith. Yeah. Um, when was this? <laughs> this was like six months ago. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I invested in my 401k and like sure. kind of, but to really say, hey, here's a big bulk of like this, here's the money that's in my savings account and I'm going to get a financial advisor. You know, I felt like I could handle it all. And so I finally said, I'm going to get a financial advisor. And they were like, this money's been in your account this whole time. Wow. And it's embarrassing because I represent athletes and I teach them financial literacy. If I had an athlete that had that amount of money in their account, I would lose it. I would lose it. But you weren't doing it for yourself. Exactly. Isn't that interesting? It's crazy. And I know the financial advisor kept saying, I feel like I'm repping one of your athletes right now. He's like, you know better. And I'm like, I know. But that when you grow up poor, your mentality, you have this fight or flight all the time, you know, this fear. And so I always wanted to make sure I had resources. Yeah. Available so, at all times. At all times. I felt this way for so long. Uh, after I was talking about this off camera, after playing arena football. Yeah. I had this surgery and I was mm -hmm. on my sister's couch for about six months and for about a year and a half, I just wasn't making any money. So I was on mm -hmm. my sister's couch for about six months recovering. Then I lived in my brother's place, playing 250 a month, just trying to like, where am I going next? Hustling. Hustling yeah. for a year and a half, making nothing. Mm -hmm. Finally, at the end of the year and a half, making like maybe a couple thousand dollars a month, but it wasn't enough to like mm -hmm. really survive and live off of and thrive. And I started to, to make more over the next few years to where I was like, okay, I have money in the bank. I'm good for a couple of years, but I would still like take, you know, Greyhound buses and like Southwest Same. middle seat back in the plane, like multiple connections. I would never Same. get a hotel room. Never until maybe like four or five uh, years ago. That's I was too like, far. I don't do that. I get a hotel I was, room. <laughs> well, as a guy, I was like, whose couch can I sleep on? Yeah. I was just like, who do I know in what mm -hmm. city? Who can pick me up? Like everything. Yeah. Who can I get some free food from? Yeah. But it was like I had the money. Yeah, it's the, you, your mindset never changed. It's weird. And I feel like I'm the same way. It's like I'm just now getting to the point where I'm like, okay, I have got to practice what I preach. Right. Right? I know I know the, how this works, so I've got to actually put into action. So. What do you think is the biggest thing holding you back from going all in on that kind of abundance mindset? Gosh, I mean, I think it's fear. Mm. I think it's fear. I think it's fear of going back, which 
is not going to happen. Right. It's 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 just not, it's not going to happen. But for some reason, there's just this like, what if? I don't have a plan B. I don't have anything to mm. lean on. I didn't grow up with a trust fund or parents with money. So it's it's me or it's nothing. You know. Wow. What so, would you think was the biggest myth about money that you were taught growing up, or you saw in the world? Uh gosh. I, it was so weird to me because I used to think I had this code with my mom when I'd go to a friend's house and I'd say, they have six chairs at their dining room table. That was our code like to say they were rich. Really? Yeah, I was like, I'm staying that at a friend's house and maybe she'd never been there and I'm like, oh my gosh, they have six chairs. Not four, not two, they have six. You know, or I'd see a friend that had a two-story house and it's like, oh my gosh, they're millionaires. And so it was just these small things which were very common in society that for me felt like, wow, that's when you know you made it. You know, that's when you know you, you have money. Um, but really, you meet millionaires, you meet people that are wealthy, and they don't show their wealth. You have no idea. Right. Yeah. Right. Some no of them might, but some of them don't. Yeah, it depends yeah, what type yeah. of person they are, how they, got the, how they got Is their money. Is it new money or old money? <laughs> you got the money quick? Yeah, maybe, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. So your book's called Agent You, Show Up, Do the Work, and Succeed on Your Own Terms. So how do you need to show up and do the work in your own life right now? to get to the next level for yourself. Oh my God, this is like a therapy session. <laughs> so many ways I need to show up. I mean, I think continuing to make good decisions financially, right? Mm -hmm. So knock down the fear. Are you writing that down while you're holding me accountable? I'm taking notes, yeah. I'm not mad at that, okay. Taking some risk. Well, I'd say taking more risks, specifically financially, but. What's the risk you haven't yet fully taken yet? I mean, I did. I just took the biggest risk six weeks ago, leaving my law firm. So that oh, was you huge. Just left. I just left. So you finally went all in on your the main thing you want to go on. <laughs> so. Six weeks ago, so I took. I wow. just took a huge risk. It was like I'm going all in on sports, and I'm going to do just one job. Because that was bringing in, I'm assuming, a nice you know yeah, six the, or plus figure salary, and then yeah. it was like the security blanket, right? Yeah, it was like, every two weeks, this is what you're getting. In sports, it's these. You know, they get a big chunk, and then God forbid you lose a player, and and it's it's gone. So, what do you think? How do you think that was holding you back from not going all in sooner? Well, I think I wasn't able to give my entire time mm. and my entire, you know, just I don't know, mentality to this one job. I was split. Like yeah. even my anxiety and stress was split. Interesting. And so, being able to finally go all in on one, I feel like I mean that that's what was holding me back from. I think greatness. People really? see me now and say, oh, you're so successful. I'm like, well, imagine if I didn't have another job. Mm. <laughs> and but I, I did with two jobs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, so I feel like it really held me back from where I am meant to go. How many years have you been doing both jobs? Seven. Seven years, both. Both. Where do you think you'll be in the next two years by being all in energy, resources, strategy with this one thing? I'm probably getting two years what took me seven, is really? my guess. Yeah. Seven with both. Seven with both. You think in two years you're able to totally. get totally. I mean, I was working 70, 80 hours a week at a law firm. This is one, it wasn't a small law firm. It's a huge international law firm. We had billables we had to meet. I was doing securities fraud litigation. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with sports. Really. And so I'm over here preparing motions and going to trial. And then oh yeah, I'm a sports agent. So that time, if I can focus it all in, yeah, I think I can do what I did in seven and two. How did you learn about goal setting growing up? Because it seems like you don't just accomplish what you accomplished by, I don't know, just accidentally. You had to have some yeah. type of framework or model or goal setting strategy. How did you think and then act yeah. to accomplish all these different things at this stage of your life? I don't, you know, I just, I always had a different level of grit. People talk about grit. I didn't have foundation. Nobody taught me anything. I didn't have role models. Mm. It almost felt like it was in my DNA. Really? Because my brother who grew up with me went down a very different path. Right, we both, we grew up very poor in a dangerous situation and he went down what the statistics would say. And so I don't know what made me go this way. And I, you know, I'm always asked that and I kind of tried to dig deep and I feel like it's just grit, mm -hmm. which is something people have and some people don't. Do you have like a framework for when you set and accomplish goals? Are you like, I'm gonna be a lawyer at this oh, yeah. day and I'm gonna be a sport, I'm gonna get my first big oh, athlete yeah. by this time. And then how do you either reverse engineer or strategize those goals to accomplish them? Yeah, so I definitely, I, I do big picture first, like what's the big goal? I think a lot of people work on smaller goals mm -hmm. first. You know, first I'm gonna do this small goal and go up the steps. I'm like, I wanna know what's at the very top of the steps and then yeah. go backwards. So if it's, I'm gonna get a first rounder, well, what is that gonna take? Is that gonna take five seventh rounders? Is that gonna take getting a job mm -hmm. at a top sports agency? 
Is that going to take making sure I'm certified in these certain states? I go big and then go backwards. And that's what you do with everything in terms of yeah, law. Yeah. When did you know you wanted to be, you know, get the, the do law in the first place, and then financial services? Like, how were those? It was all to kind of reach the same purpose of working with athletes. So you knew you wanted to work with athletes. I always knew from the beginning. Yeah, since I was probably a teenager. Really? Yeah. And you knew law was part of the path. Not originally. I mean, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, and then I thought, okay, I, maybe I want to be a financial advisor for athletes, mm -hmm. and that's why I went to Wall Street. Wow. And then when I got there, I interviewed some financial advisors, and I realized it's really the agent that's kind of the day-to-day -day person. Mm -hmm. And so the minute I determined I was on the right path, the wrong path, I deviated and went mm -hmm. to law school. Really? Like three months later, I was taking the LSAT, and you know, for me, it was all about walking in my purpose. That was critical. It didn't matter what I had to do to get there. If I had to leave a six-figure job after growing up poor, I was going to do it. Really? Yeah. How do you how do you teach people about discovering their purpose? They have no clue. They feel like they're stuck or in a rut. Man, well, first it's making sure you realize how important it is. You know, to me, your it, purpose. Yeah, and finding it. Finding mm -hmm. your purpose needs to be the most important mission of your life. You know, I always say, if you're not walking in your purpose, you're just working and living to die. Mm -hmm. And I hope it shakes people to the core when they hear that. Right? Yeah. If you're not walking in your purpose, you're just working and living to die. And so you've got to figure out what that purpose and calling is. And purpose should not be hard. Right? There's all these conversations about finding your purpose and podcasts and blogs, and it's this hard, really tough thing to figure out. It shouldn't be. Your purpose is your superpower. I talk about mm. my book. I equate it to your superpower. What is the thing that you're naturally great at? The Hulk is strong. Right? Superman can fly. When people think about you, what do they say? Mm. What is your superpower? You know? And so in my book, I kind of go down several factors of how to get to your purpose. But it shouldn't be. It's not hidden. Everybody has one. You just got to figure it out. If someone is thinking, well, I don't know what that is still, like, I, can't, I haven't been able to figure it out, I have, or maybe I've got so many passions, I'm not sure yeah. which one to choose, yep. I want to do it all, or I'm not sure what I'm good at, do you suggest they ask their friends or family? Yes. Do you suggest they get feedback from someone and say, well, what do you see in front in me? Yeah, I, absolutely. I always say, ask your friends and family, ask the people closest to you, what am I great at, and what's the first thing you think of when you think of me? Right? And if you have you want me mm. to do a favor for you, right? When you have a favor you need, you have different friends you call for different things. What's the, the perfect favor for me, right? Am I the person that you're calling in the moment when you need help budgeting or, or am I someone that comes through in the clutch because I'm just, I'm always there. You know, purpose doesn't have to be your day job. You know, your purpose could be providing support to a spouse. You know, it could be a hobby. It could be a number of things. Yeah. What about, um Biggest, biggest myths on finding your dream job. Oh. And does that line up with figuring out what your purpose is or is that different in your mind? Biggest myths. I think people see the dream job, people get the dream job and they think of an overnight success. Oh. You know, especially like even with me, they're like, oh, you know, one day she was no one and now she's got these top players and she works for this top sports agency. It they don't years. Yeah, they don't, they don't see what happened in, in private to get there. You know, they, they see this overnight success. And you have to take sometimes a lot of jobs you hate to get to your dream job. To figure out what you don't want. Yeah. To figure out what you do want. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So there's a lot of grueling work and kind of saying, hey, I hate this. I hate this. You know, crossing off the list until you sometimes get to that dream job. Yeah. I knew what I always wanted to do, but I think I'm the exception. Yeah. That's not the rule. Most people do not know. I know. So you have to try stuff that you don't like for a while. And exactly. And just don't stay there. You exactly. Know, keep, keep course correcting. What about the biggest adversity you've ever faced? What was oh that in your gosh. life? And how did you mentally and emotionally overcome it? Oh my gosh. I mean, my childhood just generally is a lifetime movie. So I have a list of <laughs> adversities. Um, you know, I think even at seven, eight years old, my biggest challenge was figuring out what I was going to eat for dinner. Really? You know, and trying to be creative and taking home food from the school, mm. right? You know, okay, which milk won't spoil that I can keep for a day or two? Wow. and navigating that for myself and my younger brother you know i think yeah the biggest adversities for me were staying alive as a kid mm. and figuring that figuring that out and you know it's just it's so weird because i just i felt like i was a parent so early i grew up so quickly and so the adversities were there but you know i, I treated it as if this is just a day job it's like okay we've got to figure out we're gonna eat let's keep it pushing as an eight-year-old yeah yeah it's crazy it's crazy saying it now out loud <laughs> 
Wow. It's my, my husband's always like, you know those stories you tell, they're not normal. Yeah. <laughs> you need to go to therapy. <laughs> what, what, were your, what were your parents at during this time? Or what was that experience like? Not there, you know, dealing, some dealing with mental health and mm -hmm. others, you know, they're just not around, not really? there. We raised, really raised ourselves. Really? Yeah. Were they in the home or is it, were you staying with other people? Uh, yeah, we, you know, we were, you know, I, we lived with my dad, but he was never around. And so we kind of were wow. just there all day raising ourselves. Wow. And, you know, we didn't come home to people checking our homework and, you know, which is odd because we did well in school. So it's like, where did that, huh. how did you, how did you where did so the motivation well? come from? Yeah. I don't know. I think mm -hmm. just, yeah, something, I feel like I always say it's like my DNA. Did you have teachers that were supportive or coaches or mentors at school that were kind of like looking after you yeah. or? I had a librarian, one librarian I remember that would like sneak stuff to me to take home because huh. she was aware. So she'd say like, oh, this is my granddaughter's sweatshirt. You know, mm, why don't you have it? Mm, that's nice. And so, but besides her, no, I actually feel like the school system dropped the ball. Yeah. Who was the most influential person in your life growing up? <sighs> you know, I didn't have anybody. I, I, hate, I hate that question because I get asked that or like, who was your role model? And I wish I, I almost thought about lying and picking someone, but mm. there was just no one. Like growing up, I didn't see people that were lawyers and doctors. I mean, based on where I grew up and, you know, it just, that wasn't there. <laughs> we weren't exposed to that. So there was no teacher, there was no family mm -hmm. friend, there was no, no one that was really um, an inspiration for you? Maybe when I got to high school, early mm -hmm. on, you know, elementary and junior high, no. When I got to high school, I mean, I think the teachers there, I went to a magnet school and it was inspiring to see kind of how many students were able to make it out that had similar circumstances, really? yeah. What was the biggest lesson you learned um, growing up then, before you got into college and after, after high school, the biggest lesson in your teen and early years? I mean, oh gosh, all the lessons I learned were boring stuff, like, you know, how to raise your credit, <laughs> <laughs> how, to, how to finance a car. I mean, those are the things I was doing pretty young to, to survive. Really? Yeah, how to make a forged driver's license, how to, Make a fake tag for your car so you can drive it because you can't afford tag. A forged driver's license? It's a whole other story. So what even, why did you have to forge this? Because I was 14 and I had to get to my magnet school, Shut which is up. across the So you were driving at 14? I was. No I was. way. Yeah, because I, I got into the magnet school, the number one school in the state, which is on the other side of town. And so I took city buses to get oh there. Gosh. And finally, I ended up getting a job at Chick-fil-A, which is the only place that hires 14-year-olds. Wow. Saved every check. Bought a Dodge Neon for $2,500. At 14? 14. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then. You made that much money at 14 and then saved your money and bought a car so you could drive. So I can go to, to the best school in the state. That is nuts. Yeah. No one was willing to drive you? There was no like. We didn't have any. I didn't have anybody. Holy cow. <laughs> I didn't have anybody. So, and then learned how to, you know, get your car insurance and. Oh my gosh. Wait, how did you not get. Can I'd you buy a car at 14? Like, how does that even work? Yeah. You just got to have connections. You figured <laughs> <laughs> Hustling, oh my gosh. hustling. So how did you even learn to drive? Yeah, I mean. That's I've, gotta be, t I was scared at 17 when I got my I license, like on the highway. I would start on the, I, mean, I remember starting on the streets and just like going places oh to gosh. get, you know, my brother, he went to school around the corner, so learning to take him. Did you take classes in driving or was it just you just jumped Not in? Not 14, you can't take classes at 14, but I didn't have a choice. Like No I one had taught to, you like, okay, this is how you do it? No. Oh my gosh, that's no. crazy. No, but they didn't teach, I mean, that, that's not, that is the least shocking of the things I was not taught. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that about you. What is, what's the thing you're most proud of that most people don't know about you that you've hmm. overcome or done? What am I most proud of? Hmm. That's a really tough question. You know, I'm proud of where I've gotten to in the sports industry. I'm proud of that. Um, I worked on a, as an attorney, I worked on a bunch of pro bono cases. And mm. so one of the cases uh, we worked on someone that was on death row and he actually ended up getting out. That's cool. And so really proud to have worked on that team. It was a very small piece of the team, but giving back. That's great. Giving back. That's great. Um, yeah. And where's your brother now? So my brother is of two brothers. Uh, one I talk about in the book who mm. actually was killed. Mm. Um, gang violence, and so that happened when I was in law school. Okay. And then my other brother, who was going down the same kind of track, I moved him to, moved him in with me when I was in law school to kind of change his life after I lost one brother. 
Wow. And so now he's in like an aviation mechanic school. I've been mm. putting him through, trying to really get, turn his life around. So he's on his way, but it took a while for him to get there. You know, we grew up in the same circumstances. And like I said, he went down the way that statistically you'd think he would. And I went this way without any parental guidance. We just both went our separate ways. And so I easily could have been him. Really? So I give him a lot of grace. Right, yeah, right, easily right. could have been him. Yeah, one or two wrong decisions. Yeah, that could have, yeah. yeah. What's your thoughts on risk taking? Because it sounds like you've taken a lot of risks from an early yeah. age and, and done things that maybe weren't the norm from where you're from. Um, and it sounds like now you're taking even more risks, leaving this other career going on in this, this yeah. mission and purpose of yours. What's your viewpoint on assessing risk, taking risk? How much risk should we take as humans? Yeah, I think risks are really important. You know, I actually talk about this in my book, The Hail Mary, you know what a Hail Mary is, mm -hmm. you know. Obviously it's a forward pass yes. that is gut-wrenching. I think everybody has professional and personal Hail Marys in their life that they have to take. Like really big moments that they have to just jump out on a limb. Like for me it was leaving Wall Street, right? That was my Hail Mary. I think it's important that we do that, but that it's timed correctly. Mm. So when I took that Hail Mary or when I left my law job, which is another big Hail Mary, I was saving and paying down debt right, right. and making sure that the risk was calculated. It wasn't just like, I'm broke and I'm gonna go do this and... Exactly, yeah. exactly. It was very much, I planned in advance for it. <laughs> what do you feel like is your superpower? Oh man. I think I have more than one superpower, actually. What are your multiple superpowers? I'm invisible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're invisible? I'm just kidding. Let's say um, I can see through people. No. Yeah. Um, you know, I think my superpower is that I'm able to, I have a weird ability to get people to kind of go to their full potential. Really? Right? Like, we're, I can talk to you and figure out, okay, what is your purpose? And somehow motivate you to move towards that, to take that first step. How do you motivate people to do that? finding a way to make sure that they believe in themselves. Like, how can I believe in them so that they believe in themselves? Wow. And I think, again, we talked about purpose. Everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a calling. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. They think, oh, I'm just here for no reason. So once I can convince you, yes, you have a purpose, and you should be working towards it, and it is achievable, I can get you to move. Wow. Yeah. Have you always believed in yourself, or did you doubt yourself a lot? No, I've always believed in myself. Really? Yeah. I just... Even in the circumstances I grew up in, I knew I would, I just always would say, no, I'm gonna be rich one day or I'm gonna be successful one day. I didn't know exactly what that looked like, but it was almost like I was a fed up kid. I'm like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> You're not living this life. <laughs> not living this ghetto life. <laughs> really? Yeah, so I've always, I've always kind of known and I think my confidence has helped me a lot. How does someone build self-belief when they've doubted themselves their whole life? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the imposter syndrome, right? Like, especially women deal with the imposter syndrome all the time. Although I'm confident in myself, it doesn't mean in isolated moments I don't feel like an imposter. So for me, building belief is sometimes faking it till you make it, mm -hmm. right? It's like, I may not be comfortable in the room, but I'm gonna be the most prepared person in the room, and yeah. I'm gonna fake it until I get to that point. So, I mean, I remember in football, before I learned the game, like texting my husband, I mean, years ago, at the time he's like my boyfriend, like, tell me what to say, you know? Mm. Literally putting, you know, faking it and I was confident and, and then at night I'm watching film like crazy and I'm learning the CBA and so, yeah, part of combating the imposter syndrome is just being over-prepared, right. you know? The more prepared you are, the more confident you become. Exactly, and it takes time. Were you, so you weren't big into football growing up? No, not at all. So why did you say like football is gonna be my mechanism for delivering my purpose why that sport mainly because the athletes in football 75 percent or so are black many of which had a very similar upbringing as me and i wanted to reach mm. people with my upbringing people that have an opportunity to make a lot of money mm. that i saw also sometimes go back like how could i fix that and i felt like i could reach more people with that kind of upbringing and, mm. and um, story if i was in football so it's very strategic. I didn't grow up watching football. I'm not some huge football fan. I don't watch football in my free time. It was always about the athlete. And, you know, I represent some rappers. I mean, it's the same. It's the same human over and over and over. Mm -hmm. They came from a certain yeah. uh, place that you can relate to. That I can mentor and, you, you want to make You want to make sure that they don't mismanage their money. or I, What's the stat with NFL players like? Three out of four. 
within go two years. Within two years or something. Yeah, within two years, they'll That's have some crazy. type of financial hardship. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's ridiculous. And so in my mind, when I used to hear that, I'm like, How is that possible? It, it didn't make sense. And I used to think, oh, it's the agent's fault. It's definitely the agent's fault. When I get in there, that's never going to happen. But that's not true. There's only so much you can do, you know? This is that human's money. Yeah, they're, they're going to spend it the way they want to do it. Whether you give them advice or not, yeah. they're going to say, okay, and then... There's a lot of people you can influence, and it's not just athletes, but mm -hmm. entertainers or whatnot. There's a lot that listen, and you'll have the one or two that there's nothing you can do. Why do you think it's so hard for people that maybe grew up in a certain mentality, it's hard for them to listen to that kind of sound advice or not take those impulsive decisions on, on around money and finances and kind of spending it extravagantly. Why do you think that's the case? I don't think there's a lot of sound advice to listen to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of times that the people in their corner or their team are yes people, yes men, yes women. And so I don't think there's the sound advice that you think there is, you know. Right. It's when financial literacy has never been taught to you, you're just doing what you think makes sense. Mm -hmm. You've never had money, so you're spending it in case it's gone one day. It's like this frantic, like, well, I'm going to spend it. What, what wisdom do you give to your athletes when they're getting, you know they're going to get a lump sum, a big sum of money? Like, what do I tell what, them? What do you tell them? What advice do you just tell them? Well, first of all, to have a financial advisor. Yeah. Right? Which I had to tell myself that. <laughs> a, a fiduciary, a financial advisor, yeah. Yeah, have someone that is certified and can help you in managing. You know, I think it's fine to treat yourself once. Mm, right? I don't want yeah. to come in and say you shouldn't be able to spend your money. You've worked extremely hard. Mm. People have things that they like. Maybe it's cars or shoes or whatever. It's when you overindulge is the problem. You can have a nice car. Right. right? You can have nice clothes, but you don't need 10 nice cars. Right. Yeah. So that's where, it's, that's where it becomes an issue. And so kind of finding that balance. Okay. When you have an athlete, you don't have to name names or anything, but when you have an athlete who maybe is not taking your advice mm -hmm. and you see them... You see them, ah, oh, they shouldn't have done this. Or I wouldn't advise them to do this, but they kept doing it over and over. Do you decide to, I'm going to stick with this person even if they're going to blow everything financially? Yeah, or do you say, listen, we've got to start making some adjustments for us to keep working together because I want you to be successful long term. And if you go yeah. bankrupt in two years, it's going to make me look bad too. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Do, you do you have those scenarios? I never want to leave an athlete hanging, mm -hmm. for sure. And so that's something, I mean, I wouldn't walk from a player, but... You know, you have to have really tough conversations. And as an agent, it can get scary. Like a lot of agents are afraid because they don't want to get fired. You mm. know, there's a fine line between, hey, I'm your agent, and then, hey, I'm bossing you around, trying to run your life. Right. And some players are not, you know, open to that, as they should not be. So for me, it's, you know, I, I like to have those hard conversations early. And if it continues on a trail that I'm like, oh, gosh, this is an avalanche that we can't stop. Intervention, I mean, I'll do anything I can. Mm -hmm. I'll do anything yeah. I can. You know, but sometimes there's there's only so much you can do. Right. And what's your greatest personal fear? My greatest personal fear, um, actual fear, a lot of my, you know, I have bad anxiety. So really? a lot of my fears are irrational. You know, like, it's what? like what would they be? Um, I mean, basic fears like I fly 100 flights a year and every day I hold my every time I'm in a plane, I hold my breath because I'm like, oh, gosh, we're going down. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the safest form of tra transportation, but <laughs> I panic <laughs> every time or if my husband doesn't answer the phone, he's clearly in a ditch somewhere. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> For sure. So it's, it's, it's really those kind of things that keep me up at night, the things that aren't likely to happen, but mm. I still think about them. Not negotiating a multi-million dollar contract. It's not those things. <laughs> Funny enough, it's not that. I can do yeah. that. <laughs> it's more like the flying. <laughs> what are you doing to support overcoming those anxieties or fears? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I, I can't say that I've... I'm doing anything actively every single day. I wish I could say I was. Um, kind of living through them. I think having a little bit of fear is okay. It's okay to be mm -hmm. afraid. It's when the fear stops you from doing something. So for me, it's like right. I still, still get on up. the plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still there. I'm holding my breath. I can't breathe. I'm panicking. <laughs> Literally having an anxiety attack. But I'm there. <laughs> on the plane. Yeah, it's not that you're living in fear and then, and then yeah, staying at home it. and exactly. not taking the action you want to do. Yeah, you're, the fear is not crippling me. That's good. So. And what's the big dream what's the big mission for you i mean for me the big mission is inspiring future generations especially women you know i really want women and you know young people to walk in their purpose and to figure out what their life calling is and to do that every single day i don't want them to get caught up in i found a job that pays good money and i can have this type of lifestyle when it's really not what you're supposed to be doing so the dream is to inspire and then to work with athletes and be able to mentor them where 
they can be successful on and off the field 20 years plus. Yeah. When should someone know it's time to walk away from a situation? Like Gosh. if you're trying these different jobs, you're like, okay, maybe it's a year or three years, but when do you know it's time to walk away? Oh, it's tough. You know, I felt like I knew I needed to leave my law firm three For, years ago. Really? <laughs> yeah. But it's, again, like we talked about fear and my circumstances growing up and having this poor kid mentality, I stuck around longer than I needed to. Mm -hmm. I think we usually know. It's about when do we actually act on it. It's not a question of do you know. You know. You just don't make the move. Where do you think you'd be if you would have left three years ago? Man, I think everything happens for a reason. So yeah. I don't know that. I think I'm in the exact right spot I'm supposed to be. I don't think I'd be any more successful had I left three years ago. I got a lot of experience as an attorney that is great and I wouldn't trade for the world. So yeah, I don't know where I'd be if I had left three years ago. I think I would be healthier as a human. I don't know if my really? sick, yeah. Because we're just working so much. Yeah, so much stress, you know, just not protecting my mental health, physical health. Really? Yeah, so I'd be, I'd be healthier. I'd be maybe a little happier because I wouldn't be so anxious all the time. I mean, the two jobs really took a toll on me. And so I'm still trying to kind of... Like recovering from that, that. It's a little PTSD yeah. almost from just like For sure. the stress of the... Yeah, and always being on, right? Like when you have two jobs, you're always mm. on. Like I'd be... When I leave here, I would normally, okay, I've got to, in the Uber, I've got to work on a motion or uh -huh. I've got to, and so kind of retraining my mind that it's okay to have personal time. It's okay to not always be working. Yeah. And so I'm not there yet. You're honest. You're honest about it. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. How would you coach yourself uh, around Agent U with where you're at right now? So an Agent U, one of the chapters is about self-care. Mm. And it sounds like you didn't do much of that in the last seven years. I'm the worst at self care. You know, for me, self care was always looked at as a reward, uh -huh. right? I felt like it was a reward. And so I had to train myself, and I'm still training myself to look at it as a priority and not a reward. Like when you work out, right? You work out really hard and you take a shower. Shower feels amazing, mm -hmm. but the shower is not a reward, it's necessary. It's a necessary task after a hard mm -hmm. task. Same thing as self care. And so trying to change my mindset to say, this is a necessary task, not a reward, even if it feels great. What would um, 30 days of uncomfortable self-care look like for you? Where you did oh, wow. things that you know would give you more energy, more fulfillment, more joy, more wow. love, more peace, less stress. If you did all these things, what would that look like? What would they be? What would that look like on a daily, weekly basis? Oh, if it was yeah. like, I can't believe I'm actually going to do this much self-care, but in the back of my head, I know it's going to benefit me so much. Man, I mean, all like? I envision for myself is panicking the whole time that I'm wasting time, really? to be honest. Yeah, I mean. But I, you just said it's necessary to take the shower. Yeah, but I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it, yeah. In the book, I talk about this concept of existing and learning to be comfortable with just being alive. Like self-care is saying, I'm okay. It doesn't have to be a massage or getting my nails done. It can be... I'm okay with doing nothing, right? existing. And Not having to be busy. Yeah, I think Brene Brown calls it like white space or something. Yeah. And so I try to teach myself, okay, it's okay. Take three minutes and just exist. Just be right here. You're not meditating. You're not spending time with God. You're literally just existing. That's really hard to do. Just sitting, doing nothing. Just being present yeah. and saying, I'm okay with this moment. For me, that's the hardest thing I do in the day. It's like, okay, don't check your phone. Don't think about anything. It's like... <laughs> You're losing your mind right now. So for me, I feel like 30 days of just self-care would be panicky for me, but I also think it would be necessary and amazing. Life-changing, probably. Life-changing? I think so. I mean, I think the self-care... What would that be on a daily basis if you were to give yourself a plan? Like if you were coaching someone okay. else at this moment? I would work out every, every day because I don't have time to work out much because I travel a lot. Seven days a week? I would work out... For 30 days? Every day. Okay. It doesn't have to be hardcore. Yeah, something. 30 minutes It could be yoga. Now. It could be... I would work out every day. Okay. I would read some type of like either self-help book, even if it's like 10, 15 minutes, the Bible, or for leisure. Uh-huh. What kind else? Of switch it up. What else would change your life? What would change? Oh, my gosh. What would change my life? Um, eating healthy. Mm -hmm. Like literally making sure that everything I put in my body is for fuel. Mm -hmm. Like eating to live, not living to eat, mm. which is my problem. Interesting, interesting. Okay, what else? Um, man, doing something that you enjoy. What are the things you enjoy? Man, that's hard. 
He just lives, <laughs> like, I've lived to work, to save money, to I make know, money, to help people. I know, you. it's terrible. What, do you, what are the things, when you think about the things that bring you the most joy that's not work related, what are those um, things? Giving. What about know, for you? For me, okay, for me. <laughs> An um, activity, a hobby, a sport, a, I know, watching I something. I this. I love watching with friends. Grey's Anatomy. Okay. This Is Us. Those are two shows that are amazing. Yeah. Best shows on the planet, clearly. Mm -hmm. So I'd watch those. Okay. Man, what else would I do? This is ridiculous. I'd get my car cleaned out once a week at least. Okay. <laughs> no, it's real, but you feel like clean space. You'll feel it's like, about, oh, energy. Yeah. Clean space is critical. What else? I'd organize a part of my room, like my closet, like reorganize things so that the, everything's visible and really easy to mm -hmm. access. What else? What else would I do? I'd get a massage at least once a week. Yeah. I might take a dance class. I like hip hop dance. Ooh, okay. I might do that. I'd probably sit outside and drink coffee in the morning while I read. If it's not too hot in Houston. <laughs> Houston is hot. Yeah, that's probably what I would do. It sounds like an amazing list. Yeah. What would it look like for you to integrate this for 30 days? Man. And where, what type of agent, partner, friend, leader would you become mm. after giving to yourself fully the things that will make you feel more loved and energized after 30 days? Wow. What type of results would you create in the world, the impact with your purpose? It'd probably be off the charts. If I, you know, if I'm really showing up as my best self. Mm. If I'm not taking care of myself, I know I'm not showing up as my best self. I'm showing up as 80%. Right. I feel like that gets you to 100. Interesting. Um, what could you create from that space? Man. I mean, I think even just being around me would be better. Not even as an agent, but as a friend, as a wife, you know, less triggered. Mm. You know, you're less anxious. You're, you know, just nicer generally. I feel like when you take care of yourself, you just have an aura about you. Yeah. You can kind of tell the people that take care of themselves and do yoga and drink smoothies and the people that don't, <laughs> <laughs> which right. are me. Right. But yeah, no, I mean, I think I could, I would, I don't know what that looks like because I've You've never, never done even it. done two of those things consistently, but I'm sure it'd be amazing. I would love to see you take on this challenge for yourself for 30 days. That whole list. The whole list and see at the end wow. of it what this experiment, do anything for 30 days. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It's true. People always say that you can do anything for 10 years. I'm like, what? For 30, <laughs> you did a lot of stuff for decades. It's fair. 30 you days. You do 30 days to take care of you. I wonder, I, I, I wonder the magic yeah. you'd create in the world by it's implementing true. this for 30 days. All these things, even as you were listing them, I was like, I could sense like, it sounds like a relief and anxious. You're like, if I sat and read and had coffee, but what if someone's calling me in this? I know. What if I was getting a massage? I'd be thinking about my clients. My to-do list, What yeah. about working out daily? I'd be on my phone checking. It's like, you'd have to create a structure in your day where the phone wasn't there and you focused on the yeah. workout. You had a trainer train you so they kept you in check. You had someone help you with the mm -hmm. health. Like, you gotta have support in this. The accountability would be critical Absolutely. for me. You gotta have the accountability. For me, I, I hire trainers, I have uh, food delivered to me that's healthy. Like, right. I set myself up in order to that. And that's why I think investing in yourself in this yeah. way could be the, the greatest thing to do. As you transition from one career yeah. into all that on this, this would be incredible. I would love to see you do this. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you're down for the challenge. No, I'm but I'd love to look, challenge you. I'm always down for a challenge. I would love to challenge you for 30 days to do each one of these things. I'm going to send you this list. Okay, I'm down. 30 days. I'm down. I'm, I, you're the one who said that it'd be like exponential results. Yeah, I feel like it would be. Because I'm always, you know, I'm like, even when you don't take care of yourself, you're sluggish and tired. And, you know, I pour into so many people. You gotta, mm -hmm. you can't pour from an empty cup. What is agent you? What is the definition of agent you? What does that mean? It's being your own agent. It's advocating for yourself. Interesting. It's knowing how to get a seat at the table. It's unapologetically living in your purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a sports agent. I represent players. I negotiate their deals. I'm in rooms that they're not in. If a regular human had an agent, imagine how successful they could be in their normal life. Now imagine if that agent was you. You right? are your own agent. You, your own agent. Downloading that inner agent in you. This book is not about how to be a sports agent. It's how to be your own agent, your own advocate, your own best self. How to do your 30-day self-care plan. Right? Yeah. Because what would, what would your agent say? Do you feel like this is the biggest challenge for you in your life? 150%. Taking care of you 100% as opposed to oh, taking yeah. care of everyone else. Oh, yeah. That is definitely number one. 
Number and you've never one. really done any of this, like not so, consistently. There's no way. No. Why is there no way? What is? Why is there no way you been, haven't been able to do that? Time was number one. Now I've got more so time. time. Time was time was the excuse. Fair, yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, man, I travel so much and like uh -huh. trying to work out. I'm in hotels. I'm on planes. I have to eat fast food. I, you know, when do I have time to watch TV? Like, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of time to do that. I have so much to do. What it's, if you scheduled this first on your calendar yeah. every day for 30 days as this is a non-negotiable? Yeah. For however long this takes, maybe it's two, two and a half hours a day. Maybe it's three hours. That's, That's scary That's non-negotiable. Yeah, three hours then a are, day on myself. That's then you're crazy. focused on the other things, laser yeah. focused from a full place. Yeah. Not maybe like a 80% place. I'm up for the challenge. I think Never it'd be it. crazy to see what you yeah. create at the end of it. Yeah, I'm up for the challenge. I'm going to send this to you afterwards. <laughs> Please do. Because as I'm, as I'm Please do. interacting with you. I need it. You, I need it. As I'm interacting with you, this is our first time meeting, seeing the book. It's about showing up, doing the work, and succeeding on your own terms. It sounds like you've been in this process your entire life, and you yeah. continue to take the steps in the process. Yeah. Um, and it also seems like there's other stuff that's, that's mm -hmm. available for you. Not yeah. missing, but that's available for you to even go to another level for yourself personally. I agree. For your clients, for your mission, for your purpose and everything. I agree. And I think personally, this is my person one human being's opinion, when we discount our 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 needs and our self care and our love for ourselves, when we abandon those things, we abandon our creator. We abandon our greater mm. purpose. We yeah. we abandon the people around us because we're we're, we're not fully giving what we need for ourselves mm. and we're coming from a place of 80% or yeah. 60% or 50% and that's an abandonment of our gifts. It's mm. my one human being's opinion. This is a sermon. I may be wrong. <laughs> I may be wrong. But I know that. I need to hear that. I know that in the last couple months I've been fully going in on a lot of these things you've been talking about. Really? I, I went back into, I'm a big salsa dancer. I went back and started taking private lessons oh, again. Fun. I started boxing uh, classes one-on-one. -on -one. I got hired a trainer to come work with me. Again, I started getting better foods. But started... what was the moment? Like, why? Why did you say, okay, now I'm going to go get the trainer again? Um, I went through a, a, a relationship transition that, okay. that freed up some time and had me think a little clearly about what I needed to start doing for myself more as, a part, okay. as opposed to abandoning certain aspects to like give to other people. So it's like a big life event. Yeah. I mean, it was a moment where I was like, okay, why? And it wasn't like I was never doing these things. I was pretty good, but I think I was just abandoning certain things. And since I've been doing it the last couple months, I just feel like, wow, I'm feeling really? more of myself. I'm feeling okay. more clear and focused. I'm eliminating distractions in my life that I don't need to do. Mm. I'm saying, wow, why am I spending so much time on these activities that aren't actually supporting me or my mission? Mm. I was doing them because I felt like I needed to or because I wanted to be busy. But now that I'm scheduling the things that fill me up yeah. first and making those, I've got private uh, Spanish lessons I'm doing. I just did really? a class a couple hours ago. Now, I had, an, I had an interview in the morning. Yeah. Um, I did a Spanish class, and I was like, yesterday, and I'm trying to improve my brain health. So I did it yesterday. I did Spanish lesson in a hyperbaric chamber. So it's, what? So it's like, how can I improve my self-care wow. and learn something that's important to me? And then I went right to a workout after, and I had an interview in the morning, and I'm working on emails afterwards, and I'm connecting with friends, but it's scheduling it in okay. and making all these things priority throughout the week. It's like, how are you going to schedule it in? How are you going to find the time? Mm -hmm. And not negotiating with a, a circumstance or an excuse of, well, I've got to travel today. Well, how are you going to schedule it in? Really? How are you going to schedule it in when you travel? What does it look like? Is that okay. a hotel workout today? Is that someone Skype calling with you that's like coaching you? Is that in mm -hmm. the airport? Is that 10,000 steps today? I don't know what it is. Wow. But it's pre-planning for yourself for the week and having it scheduled in. And that's mm -hmm. the non-negotiable. I think if, yeah. if we all started living from that place, I'm not saying there's going to be challenging days that are hard to do them all. Yeah. And uh, But when you say this is a non-negotiable for 30 days, I fully believe your mm -hmm. life's going to transform. I'm going to do it. And your business, everything is going to be exploding. I'm and your heart is going to be so full. Full. Because you've never experienced this. I've never. Yeah. I'm going to do it. And I like what you said about... Really outsourcing. Like if you have the resources, use Absolutely. the resources. Use the resources. And this is Get what goes trainer. back into an abundance mindset. I know. It's hard when you've, you're like, oh, I don't want to spend that money on this. Yeah, but it's but when worth it. It, it fills you back up and it creates more from you. Yeah. You down for the challenge? I'm totally down. 
Because I'm gonna I'm gonna text you, <laughs> and I'm gonna stay I'm gonna stay on <laughs> you and say where you're at. I'm gonna get a weekly check in. I want to we- I want to check-in. be this person because I am the person that's telling everyone work hard, mm-hmm. get your goals, be mm-hmm. successful in your career. You know, never stop working. I want to be the person that has the balance. That's not worried about overworking, mm-hmm. just hard work. They're not the same. Right. Ooh. Right. I'm, overworking, I'm, not hard work. They're different. Yeah. They're What's different. What's the difference? I mean, working hard is something that you you need to do to be successful, but overworking is pushing your body and your mind in places it was not supposed to go. And I have always done that. I want to be the human that works hard, but has the balance, you know, balance, but balance is so, it's so tough. I'm so black or white. It's like, I'm either on a diet, killing it, working out every day, or I'm binge eating, Mm -hmm. haven't seen a gym in a year. The gray, like every year my, my New Year's resolution is be gray. Mm. What is gray? You know, don't be black and white, be gray. Yeah. You know, it's okay to have. Give yourself some grays, but make sure you're consistent, but yeah. How? How do you do that? When you're so type A, type A, it's I like know. you're one way or the other. Yeah. So I would love to be able to do that. And I'm not saying you'll be able to do this for, you know, a whole year, but I think kickstarted with 30 days and then, okay, can I do this 80% of the time, yeah. you know, and then it's going to be sometimes I travel and, you know, whatever, there's going to be some gray. Agreed. But I think if you could create this, it's going to set you up for an incredible next couple of years, personally. Yeah, help me live longer, you know. If you live longer. (laughs) Work out. I mean, taking care of yourself, number one. What is the, um, what's the greatest lesson you learned in the last uh, year of working at these two jobs? As you transition out of this job, what was the greatest lesson of overworking what it sounds like you were doing? Um, that success does not equal happiness. Ooh. I remember when, I think it was three years ago, I had signed my highest draft pick ever. I had won like woman of the year, and, you know, had a number one overall pick in softball. All these amazing things happening, made more money than I've ever made. And I remember looking back, I had made a birthday post actually, like, oh, here's all the great things I did this year. And I remember being like, man, this is the least happy I've ever been. And so I think wow. I learned really quickly that success and happiness, I mean, the, people try to conflate those terms are very different. You can be successful and not be happy. And so for me, the milestones don't make me happy. I'm very much a journey girl, mm. right? The journey, it's all about, I want to get there, I want to get there. When I finally hit the goal, it's real anticlimactic for me. Mm-hmm. It's almost depressing. It's like, okay, I did it, now what? So right. it was really a wake-up call. And what I'm trying to do is learn how to be present in the moment when I hit the goal, be okay with the okay, I hit the goal, let's celebrate it. Like instead of it going, kind of being like, well, what's next? Like taking a moment to really take it in. Celebrating the success and the accomplishment of the years of hard work is so important. It is. But for me, it's always like, okay, well, what's the next goal? Mm. What's the next step? And that's unhealthy. Right. You know, you need to be able to be okay with celebrating what you've done and taking a moment to live in that moment right. before going to the next. Yeah, I think success doesn't equal happiness, but also, I think also you can still be happy and successful at you the same can, time. You can, exactly. But yeah. it doesn't, you know, it's it's different, and people think once I hit success, then I will be happy. You've got to find happiness separately. Before you become successful, yeah. be happy, and success yeah. will add to it. It's more fun. Exactly. It's really joy, right? Happiness yeah. is about what's happening. Joy is eternal. How much joy do you feel on a daily basis? Um, it's something I'm working on. Mm-hmm. It's something I'm working on. You know, I, I, you know, I feel it. But I, my mom, I watch her. She doesn't have much. She never had much, but she's always just so joyful. Right, she's have two pennies to rub together, but there's mm, no one I've met really. who just is happier to be alive than her. And so, you know, I look at her and I'm like, she doesn't have anything, and I have everything in her mind. Interesting. And our our outlooks on life are just so different, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's something I'm working on. It's not like I'm not happy all day. Right. You know. What's the greatest lesson your mom's taught you? I mean, she instilled my in my, in my faith. You know, mm. I'm really blessed to have learned about Jesus from my mom. You know, she gave me. Nothing else except, you know, how to worship Jesus and how to be a giver. <laughs> so the two things, but I feel like they were the most important gifts of my life. That's cool. Yeah. What about a greatest lesson from your dad? Um, hmm, that's a tough one. He's an immigrant, you know, he came over here with nothing and, you know, had to hustle. He definitely taught me you have to survive, mm. you know, you got to no matter what the circumstances are, he kind of taught me to survive. You know, I knew how to survive as a kid. I think 
now that I'm older, I'm trying to go from surviving, surviving to thriving. Mm -hmm. You know, stop living mm -hmm. in a survival mode because right. I can do that. I can do that well. Learned how to do that. Yeah. So it's like, okay, now how about thriving? Yeah. And like you said, living in abundance and being okay with spending your money and enjoying the moment versus just surviving, getting to the next point. Right. Yeah. It seems like you've done an amazing job of building your personal brand. And yeah. how, what's your thoughts on and your strategies on building a personal brand? Because you weren't like, an influencer no, or a content a creator, you were like working at a law firm and, and then, you know, like <laughs> representing other personal brands, essentially, yeah. other athletes and yeah. influencers. So how do you learn to build your own personal brand and why is it important for every individual to build their personal brand, whether in a corporation or not? Actually, I have a whole chapter on this in my book about building a brand. I believe every professional is a brand, lawyers, mm -hmm. doctors, etc. I think we always look at entrepreneurs and influencers as the people that have brands. Once I learned that we're all brands, it really changed my career. You know, I decided to build a brand because I wanted to get athletes to come to me. Uh, I didn't have time to recruit wow. like other agents because I had another job. And so I had to get creative and I thought, okay, if I have a brand where I'm a household name, where when somebody thinks of a sports agent, I'm the first name or one of the first names that comes to mind, then I've done it right. How'd you do that? Man, it starts with picking out your pillars of your brand, mm -hmm. right? I think every brand has a few pillars and everything you do falls under those pillars. Like for me, it's, it's sports and it's women empowerment and mentorship. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm posting on my social media or on my website, anything that is on that page is under one of my pillars. Yeah. And so finding what that brand kind of parameters are and then being consistent with it. Mm -hmm. You know, your followers and your fans, they sign up for something, giving right. them what they signed up for. Mm. When did you start really going all in on kind of content and building a brand online? I would say it's been about three or four years okay. when I first started you know it was a slow start but I just I remember making a decision like I'm gonna be the first agent everyone thinks of I'm, wow. gonna, I'm gonna make a decision like it was very intentional I'm about to build a brand as a sports agent and it has not been done and I think most people probably know of Jerry Maguire the fictitious agent mm -hmm. maybe one or two agents but you can't name a sports agent just right. naturally right and so I made the decision I said you know what when people think of that they're gonna think of me that's cool but everyone should feel that way if you're a baker you right. want people to think of you first if they need a cake. And do you think of like, okay, there's, I don't know, 20,000 sports agents. I'm just, make, I'm just making <laughs> yeah. up. How many are there? I don't know. 900 those. NFL agents. Oh, 900 yeah. agents. Yeah. Okay, I'm way off. But there's a <laughs> thousand, let's say, agents. How do you, do you think of like, I'm going to lean into my uniqueness? Like, yeah. use the differences or the uniqueness and the mm -hmm. talents that I have and not try to be like the other agents, but just go all in obnoxiously on who I am? Is that what you think of? 100%. Living so you in stand my out. Yeah. living in my authentic self every single day. Yeah. I decided to show up exactly of who I am every day. You know, and I think I wouldn't be on this podcast. I wouldn't have a book if I didn't make that decision day one that I was gonna be me. Right. You know, I got a lot of advice a lot of advice early on to blend in and I was like, you know what? I'm not taking that advice. I'm gonna be who I am. Yeah. I um there's a quote from a woman named Sally Hogshead who says, Different is better than better. Mm. And being good, different yeah. is better than better because you're going to be unique, you're going to be stand out, you're going to be a one of a kind, and you may not be better yeah. than the best sports agent at this moment, but you're different I and that's that. better for you yeah. than being better. I agree. And I think if, if people can approach that and say, what makes me unique and how can I lean into that more and more? Like for me, I'm a big salsa dancer and I wasn't posting yeah. salsa stuff until recently. And it's getting the most engagement and comments and people are like, wow. post more of this. Yep. Um, you know, playing guitar with my brother who's an amazing jazz violinist and they're like, post more of this. It's like, these are mm -hmm. unique things for me that I haven't always shared and I'm trying mm -hmm. to lean into it more and more and I think that's You are the advice. secret sauce. Exactly. No one else can do the talents that you have, the exactly. experience you have, the life you grew mm -hmm. up from, the, mm -hmm. the lessons, the whatever. Even if you give them the recipe. If I give you my spaghetti recipe, the exact instructions, your Can't. sauce is still gonna taste different. Different. I'm the secret <laughs> sauce, you're the secret exactly. sauce. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and people are gonna be attracted to you. I love this. Um, what's a question you wish more people would ask you that they don't ask? Oh, man, that's a good question. What do I wish they asked me but that they don't ask? Um, how are you? How are you feeling? Mm, how are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good, I'm feeling okay, I'm a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get yeah. a lot of questions about how to get in the business and like yeah. when I meet people, how to be a sports agent and 
think people forget like, hey, I'm a human and mm -hmm. you know, more of the like checking in, like, how are you doing? Like, where, you know, yeah. you, how's your mental health? How's your physical health? How, how's, how's Nicole Lynn doing? Mm. Not agent Nicole Lynn, how's Nicole Lynn yeah, doing? Personal Nicole Lynn, yeah. Yeah, and so I think people kind of forget about that. Say that. That's what I'm going to do over the next 30 days. I'm Every day, how are you? Once a week. <laughs> no, once a week. Once a week, I'm going to check in with you. I'm going to, we're going to create a list. Oh, my gosh. We'll send it to you. August 1st. August 1st. Yeah, we'll give it to <laughs> August 1st, the start of the month. Got to have the August one. You can't start it yet. Yeah, time. exactly. And um, we'll do that August 1st. I'm going to text you. I can do it. Every week. I'm not going to have you text me on the weekends when you've completed the week. Okay. I'm and going to. I'm going to check in on you for four weeks. And see I'm going to be like can. an NFL training camp and I'm going to be working out in the hotel, I guess. Work out with the guys, you know? It's just like, I'll Clearly. jump in there. Exactly. Kill them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Um, you've got this book we've been talking about called Agent You, Show Up, Do the Work, and Succeed in Your Own Terms. People can get it online. They can go to bookstores. Where's a place they can connect with you personally? And where's the website for more about you? AgentNicoleLynn.com or AgentNicoleLynn on Twitter, Instagram. Where do you hang out more, Twitter, Instagram, or both? Um, I'd say both. You know, Twitter, it's heavy, heavy sports. So if mm -hmm. you like sports, Instagram, you'll get mostly sports, but, you know, mentorship. I like to post kind of this the blueprint of how I am a sports agent. That's cool. You know, if yeah. you ever want to get into sports, I, I put all the tips on my page. That's cool. Yeah, it's fun. And uh, I see my guy Emmanuel and Sarah both on the back praising yes. for you, both both friends of mine, so it's inspiring to see. Gabrielle Union wrote the foreword. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Where's her name on here? I know, she's a good... You gotta put her name on the front, I you know, know. what I'm saying? <laughs> Forward by Gabrielle Union. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta leverage that, that's good, yeah. good marketing. Um, this is a question I ask everyone at the end of our interview, it's called the three truths okay. question. So I'd like you to imagine a hypothetical scenario. Okay. It's your last day on earth many years away from now. It's really sad. It it's is. the most depressing day no, of my lived, life. No, you've lived as long as you want to live. Okay, 200 years. <laughs> Perfect. You lived, you lived 200. Clearly. And then it's your last day. Okay. Eventually, you got to call it quits, right? Okay. On this, this life. Uh, and you've accomplished all your dreams. You've lived the life that you want to live. You do self-care every day. You're helping wow. athletes. You're doing all these things. Whatever your dream life is, you actually create it. Okay. From here until whenever you pass. But for whatever reason, you've got to take all of your materials with you or it's got to go somewhere else. So your book, your content, the things you've said, no one has access to this anymore. It goes to the next place, somewhere else. Mm. But you get a piece of paper and a pen and you get to write down three things you know to be true, three lessons. And this is all we would have to be reminded of you from your all of your work and all of your material are these three lessons that you would share with the world. Wow that they would have to use in whatever they wanted to use. What would you say are those three truths for you? God is real. Mm -hmm. The second truth is that finding your purpose is the most important mission of your life. And mm -hmm. the third, marry the right person. <laughs> marry the right person. Man, why does that seem to be so hard for so many people? It's tough. People are always like, how are you so successful? What's the number one thing you can tell me to do? Marry the right person. I couldn't do what I do if I had married someone else. It would be draining. Yeah, it's a support system. You're a yeah. team, it's, you know, it's, it's a partnership. Mm -hmm. And that partnership is critical to your success. But that's a whole nother book. <laughs> right, right. How long so, have you been married for? Nine years. How did you know that it was the right person? Man, I just knew. Isn't that crazy? I just knew. I was one of those, I mean, we dated for like 10 months and then we're married. Wow. I'm one of those stories. It's like, we dated and like six weeks in, it's like, I guess you're probably my husband. I think you are, you know? And just here we are. People thought we were nuts. We're going now on our 10th year. Wow. So I was like, I think it worked out. <laughs> What's been the, the key to knowing it's yeah. a great fit or it's aligned? And then the key to also sustaining it and making sure it stays that way yeah. after well, the, 10 years. The sustaining is that love is not enough. Gosh, I've been saying that so much lately. Love not is not enough. at all. And you have to make a decision every day to stay married. Wow. Marriage is very hard. People don't talk about that. People like to make it look like it's all roses right. and it's hard. It's a, you show up every day, it's like going to work every single day and choosing to love someone. Wow. You know, it's an action. But yeah, love is not enough. You know, companion, compatibility, chemistry. I mean, there's so many different factors here that that are important. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could say it's just all about love, and it's not. It's BS. You guys had all the other stuff, though. You had the. Well, you know, some of it grew over time. Right. We're very different. Some mm -hmm. of it grew over time. 
some, some of it was, we're very different in these things and we've got to learn how to live with these differences because no one's changing. Right, you accept each other. Yeah. If we don't accept each other, yeah. it's gonna be miserable. So you accept it or leave, right? Yeah. It's like, and so we made the choice, okay, we're gonna stay. So what, as we make that choice every day, what does that look like? What does it mean when you wake up every day to make the choice to fight for your marriage? Mm -hmm. You're fighting for your marriage even when the marriage is great. Right. Every day you wake up, you're fighting for your marriage. Love's not enough. It was not enough. I've been saying that. That's, that's a good sign. Um, I want to acknowledge you, Nicole, for for a moment for your your gifts, for everything you've done to overcome. From thank you. I mean, getting food at eight and nine that's helped you and your brother to forging a driver's license to just doing whatever it takes yeah. to survive and to thrive and to be an example for other people. Thank you. I acknowledge you for uh, making the the big risk, taking the risk to leave something that you've been comfortable with for a long time, which is probably not hard to leave, yeah. and to go all in on something that you're really passionate about. Yeah. And I acknowledge you, even though maybe you wanted to do it sooner, you did it at the right time for you. Yeah. And uh, I acknowledge you for not beating yourself up. Yeah. It's like a lot of us beat ourselves up for things we didn't do, yeah. we should have done, and you're just like, you know, it's the right timing, it, it, ha it needed to happen this way. Mm. I acknowledge you for allowing me to uh, try to bring out of you the things that might be <laughs> Uh, lacking yeah. that could support you that could take you to the next level because that's part of my mission is to help serve people get to their next level So I acknowledge you for saying you're committed to this and I'm gonna check in on you Please do. So, uh, and um, yeah, everything you're up to I'm really excited about it. And it's, thank been, you. it's been great to meet you. Yes. I'm so happy to be here. I'm, yeah. Thank you for having me on your of show. Of course, of course My final question is what's your definition of greatness? Oh, man definition of greatness Man, wow I could just write an essay on what does it mean to be great? You know, when I think about greatness, I think about not whether you have what it takes. I believe almost everybody has what it takes. I think people don't think that. I think everybody has what it takes, but it's will you do what it takes? Ooh. And that's the difference. A lot of people listening, you have what it takes, but will you do what it takes to be great? Greatness is doing whatever it takes to get there. Yeah. Wow, cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate you very much. Thank you for having me. Of course. It's amazing. Thank good stuff. If you got value from that, then go ahead and stick around for more coming up right now. What's been the biggest lesson uh, for you in the last, uh, since the accident, which has been what, 15 years now? Biggest lesson you've learned about yourself in the last 15 years? Oh gosh, you're starting with a hard one. Um, I think a lot of what I've learned in the last 15 years has just been finding community and people to support in a positive direction. I feel like it's been like not, I mean I grew up with an incredible family but then once I became an adult it's like you're still, I'm so attached to my family still yet but like you know meeting my husband mm. and like just creating a team of like-minded people to help me achieve what I want to achieve. and. Yeah, there's just been so much that's happened in the last 15 years. It's mind-boggling, um, entering into motherhood and, yeah, learning to communicate properly. Uh, <laughs> you, couldn't, just, you couldn't communicate properly before? I would say no. I mean, especially once you enter into a marriage, it's just you're constantly challenged to communicate properly. And mm. this is the person you love more than anyone, but it's like you get the most comfortable and you can get almost like lazy. And I would say like just finding like healthy communication has been a big one. Wow, what's been the hardest part of marriage for you? Um, I would say communication. Really? I mean, we've had <clears throat> such a beautiful marriage. We're coming up on, shoot, six or seven years now. Um, this month, August, are we in August? Yes, we We're are. August, yeah. Um, so, We've had a really beautiful marriage, and I mean, Adam kind of came into the Bethany world, which is a bit chaotic. <laughs> it's like super rad and fun, yeah. but like he had a time Chaos. of adjustment, and it wasn't his life anymore. It was no, like... yeah, and like just adjusting to, you know, I don't know. We make such an incredible team, and we have so much fun together, and we really like we mesh well, but. Yeah. It's just life's hard and you're always just growing together and getting through and just trusting God and yeah, yeah it's it's been so awesome. Wow.
What's and the, then having kids too is like a whole nother like. Woo. How long were you married before kids? A year and like two months. Okay. So. Do you wish you would have had a few more years? We together? were aiming for like four years. Really? So when we got pregnant, we were like, oh wow. It's happening. <laughs> so that's a part of. Um, my new documentary is I was mid filming my documentary and then I found out I was pregnant and really? we were like should we even do this should we keep going then we did so that became part of the story and yeah it's a pretty cool aspect I'm excited to share because I get pretty like raw and real and mm. I wasn't I didn't feel ready for motherhood and really I wasn't like embracing it which I'm like kind of an embracer so for me to kind of reject this like God-given beautiful gift felt, um, I look back on it now and I'm like, that's okay, but I don't like agree with that, that mm -hmm. Bethany now. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, motherhood's amazing. I love my son <laughs> Tobias made life that much better. Really? And now we have Wesley and he's like throwing us for a roller coaster, but he's amazing <laughs> too. So did you feel like you weren't ready for it or you were? I think I just had, I was at a place where I was like pushing my surfing the best I had ever surfed and just at this place of progression and growing and just kind of rocking it and then all of a sudden I'm pregnant and I'm like oh shoot like it kind of throws one thing off of the track yeah. to focus on another thing right? and I was just kind of like oh I wanted a few more years with you hon like before the baby but it's been amazing so is there anything, not looking back is there anything in your life you would change differently like the years you got pregnant, when you got married, like the accident, would you change it? Would you wish, I wish I had four more years before the accident. Do you wish like, anything differently? No, because I love my life now and I'm so thankful for where I'm at. And I'm like, gosh, if I changed it, like there's some things I'd look at like in the younger years of my competitive surfing mm -hmm. career with one arm, yeah. And, like 16 um, years old or? <laughs> like six, well, more like 18 to uh -huh. 21. Uh -huh. Uh, I just wish I had found like the right support and like really hunted down people to like really mm. support me. Whereas like surfing at that time was just growing to be more like professional-esque. Professional-esque. Because mm. surfing has come from more of like a cruisy background. Whereas now the Chill, sport relax. of surfing. Now there's um, money involved. A part of the World Surfing League is like legit pro like you're making good money or it's just very professional now kind of it's mm. just so different yeah but you didn't have the right team but when then you yeah i just didn't i don't feel like i had the right support then um or people to kind of give me like i was just doing good in competition but not quite where i could have been like, I it, think. was it more of a coach or is it more of like family support friend coach, support coach like you didn't have the right like coach. coach and just people to like help training bring out mindset, the drive in me because yeah. I already am like naturally driven but I just but then I took a break from competitive surfing and then that's when I met my husband so it's like why would I change that when I'm like really happy with the man I get to share every day with and the father who's mm. absolutely incredible and now we're doing all kinds of stuff and I'm still doing contests and yeah, I'm still surfing better than ever. Really? As a mom of two. Now you're surfing better than Yeah, me. for sure. When you're 24, best shape of your life, whatever. Yeah, better now. Free, no responsibilities. Yeah, maybe it's the maturity hmm. or just, it just goes to show if you work hard, like, I don't know, you can keep going after yeah. you have kids, so. Yeah, wow, <laughs> it's inspiring. So you're surfing better. Do you just feel like a sense of wisdom, like you understand how, the ocean works better and you understand which chances to take and you know, you know your body more or what's... I think it's kind of a combination of everything, yeah. um, especially just kind of hunting down opportunity. So I, I look for what I want and then I just like go get it. Now. Right. So it's fun. That's cool. <laughs> Was there ever a time where you really doubted yourself? Because I know, I think I saw you were back on the ocean like four weeks after the accident. Is that true or is it? Yeah, four weeks, weeks later. You're back in the ocean with stitches. I mean, I know. was in the hospital and I was like, I don't know if I can surf and I don't know what my future looks like. But then I talked with a guy who had lost his leg to a shark and he learned how to surf with one leg. 
So that was my first hint of inspiration, and that was before I left the hospital. So I had already set my mind to try surfing. I didn't know if I could do it, but I was going to try and get out there. And then as soon as I got up on my first wave, it was no turning back. And yeah, I'm thankful because the ocean is so much fun. It's for sure <laughs> the funnest sport in the world. Wow. Did you ever doubt sure, yourself, though? Yeah, I mean, just last week I doubted myself. Like, you're always, like, going up and in down. In the ocean or? Yeah, I mean, I, I was Where in two surfing? contests and I did not succeed in either event. Where, so where, where, was, where was the contest? It was in Southern California. And so, like, there's a sense of, like, ah, oh, like, that is just not feeling good. Yeah. <laughs> But I was also like, the conditions were absolutely terrible. Well, one event was okay, but the second event was like, the waves weren't breaking. It was like, and mm. I'm like a big girl, like tall, almost six foot. Yeah. So when you're put in like really little, little waves, it's hard like, to get not up, even right? as high as my knee. That's hard to get up, like, right? Oh, yeah, I need a little power behind it. You need a little more momentum too. I mean, you have to be able to use your arms faster in a smaller wave, Yeah, right? it's like my favorite waves to surf are waves that like, I literally cannot even paddle into the wave. Like I position myself and lean into it. <laughs> to yeah. stand up, right? Yeah, exactly. I've surfed like three times in my life, a Waikiki beach or something. Oh, like 15, perfect. 15, 20 years ago or something, yeah. I tried to surf out here one time I can't remember, like near Carlsbad or something. Okay. And I just was, I could not get up. I think the board was so small. Oh, you need a, big, need a big board. board. Like yeah. learning, you got to start on a big nine. I'm a giant. But yeah, you need, a, you need a big board for sure. It needs sure. to be stable. I need to like, yeah. Yeah, it's like you need to spend probably a year on a big board unless you were going like every day. Wow. And then you'd like slowly work your way for down. Like a month or something. When I come to Kauai next, you'll have to... I'll have to come out and watch you, and I'll take the big board next to your little <laughs> tiny board. And yeah, let's do, do it. The, do the baby waves. You can serve with Tobias. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Four-year-old, yeah. <laughs> He's probably better than me. Is he surfing right now? He's pretty good. Oh, my gosh. I don't want to surf with him. I'll find some teacher out there to like, show me <laughs> the basics. That's crazy. So when you're uh, up against uh, a world champion who's next to you in a competition or someone who's top five in the world, what do you think about when you're about to drop in the wave or you're going up against someone like that when they're able to swim faster and able to maybe do something that you're not sure if you can do right now? What do you think about? Well, it's interesting because the sport of competitive surfing, I literally, it's more about the ocean than my competitor. Mm. Like it's mastering the ocean. It's adjusting to the conditions you have, the waves you have and like performing the best you can on the waves you're given. And like with surfing now too, you end up taking turns. So, I mean, there is a, a, a bit of luck. There's a bit of, there's a lot of strategy, um, but it essentially comes down to mastering the ocean, which is like the more daunting aspect really, because yeah, the ocean like is always, death. the ocean is always humbling you and kind of like putting you in your place. So that's more of what I'm thinking about. And of course, like when you're going up against a world champ, okay, yes, you are like, okay, I got a tough heat at hand. I really got to master the ocean yeah. to like the best of my yeah. ability because they're a world champ for a reason. So like there is thought towards them, but like really it comes down to mastering the ocean wow. and like succeeding in a short window of time and like, yeah, doing well, so. How do you, when you're, you see a 40 foot wave, I saw this in the trailer, 40 feet, is that what it was, the wave? I guess so, How, yeah. it's, it's something huge, right? It was big. It's massive, I was Ginormous. like, is that even you? I didn't even think that was you. I was like, is that possible? <laughs> it was massive. How do you have the courage to go and try something like that? Like bigger and bigger and bigger, knowing that if you crash, like it's gonna keep you under for a while, isn't it? Yeah, well, Do you ever I... get scared of that, <laughs> I mean like, yeah, I mean, I have a lifetime of training to prepare for this moment. Mm -hmm. And then I also grew up in a family of chargers, like people that like both my mom and dad surf big waves. My brother surf big waves. My, especially my middle, um, my one up brother, he charges like crazy slabs. Slabs are like kind of the mutant waves that don't even look like a wave. Freakish waves. <laughs> They're like, like I remember one like session, waves. I was like, he's gonna die. Like I was crying in the car, like, 
I love you. Like, wow. If you die, Tsunami like, waves, I love yeah. you. <laughs> like, that sort of thing. So, uh, like Laird Hamilton style, like crazy. Yeah, like. but even like more mutant, like Laird surfing waves that you can actually like surf. Really? He's like going after these like mutant waves. It's got to be towed in. There's like a small like number of people that yeah. are into these mutant waves that are just like death death waves, but. So I've grown up in like this environment of charging and trying to keep up with my two older brothers and also on an island where there's really great waves and all winter long we're getting huge swells. So as I grew up, I would like continually kind of build up in bigger and bigger surf. And mm -hmm. and then I, I was talking to someone the other day, I have a really good breath hold, but I've been training my breath hold since I was like seven years yeah. old. My dad would take me to this like local lava rock pool and we would go underwater and like try to swim the whole pool length. And then once we made it to the end, we'd try to swim the whole pool length and back. Wow. So it's like kind of this, you take a lot of confidence in your preparation for this day so that when you finally get that chance to surf something crazy and ginormous is what I call it to my three, four year old, I say it's ginormous <laughs> out there. Um, then you are ready. Yeah, you're more you just, ready. Yeah, and then for sure you want to be mentally like just spry that day, but... What do you do when you're in the situation where it feels like you can't get out? How do you... Where does your mind go? Where does your heart I've go? I've kind of trained myself to stay calm underwater. Kind of so in like certain types of ways where you're not as worried about like dying underwater. <laughs> um. The ones where you're worried about dying underwater, what do you think about? No, no, but the ways you're not worried about dying underwater, you practice. So you practice okay, kind of yeah, like yeah. staying calm. You're getting like kind of ragdolled, like a doggy ragdoll yeah. and a dog, a doll. And so you practice just like, okay, I'm just relax the body, the muscles, Let like the just wait it, wait it out. And so then when you get to the really heavy waves, you're like already have that practice of like just letting it. Because you can try to like fight it and come up in the ocean. Just, you, just either way, you got to kind of wait. Yeah, like yeah. sometimes maybe you'll get like two seconds up faster, but like really you just got to wait it out until the water like calms. So yeah, you're just, I just kind of take you that meditate, relax. over into the just like calm down. But sometimes you're like, <laughs> and I don't know if you know much about breath holding, do you? Like, so your ribs start to kind of like convulse. Yeah. So it's like if your ribs are convulsing, which I have never had a hold down where my ribs started convulsing. So, you know, and I know that I can, like my one of my longer breath holds is like over four minutes. Wow. So I'm like, under okay. Press, I, under pressure? No, this was like calm. static, yeah. calm. So, but I still like take confidence and like, well, I technically could hold it for three, four minutes, but yeah. like, Granted, it's way different when you're getting ragdolled, but like, I'm like, okay, I could do a good 45 seconds, you know? Yeah. Wow. What is your greatest fear? Oh, I don't know if I have like a greatest fear. Um, I take motherhood pretty seriously, so just, I don't like decide off of fear, but I kind of, um, just don't want to blow it, you know? Mm. What and, would blowing it look like? Well, I mean, my husband and I talk a lot about, like, just caring for our relationship first and foremost, because I think that um, speaks more louder than anything for our kids. So having us have a healthy relationship yeah. and loving him well and making sure we get time together. And then just being present and a part of my kids' lives and, like, just sharing fun times together, but also like, I just, I don't know, I just want my boys to be like respectful, kind young men and <laughs> yeah. Every just, mom wants that, right? Yeah, but many of our decisions as mothers, like in how we raise them will hugely affect that. So yeah. being that mom that kind of guides them towards those. Which Tobes is like, he's so amazing. I mean, Wesley's amazing too, but Tobes has this sense of like chivalry already. I'm really? Like, yeah. Do you feel like you taught him that or is your dad? I think I've father? taught him, him it a bit, but I also think he, it naturally comes to him too. Like he's very thoughtful towards other, other mm. people. And lately I've noticed like he held the elevator door for me because I was like, 
just taking too long in the elevator. <laughs> I'm not gonna say why, but. <laughs> and he, um, I was like, can you please hold the elevator? And then I was like, thank you so much. And I looked at him and he was like, had this like huge mm. smile on his face. Wow. Like he just held the elevator door. That's cool. He was so happy. <laughs> Wow. So we'll see, though. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the greatest lesson uh, your mom and dad taught you? Oh, man. I mean, they encouraged me in my faith in God, which mm -hmm. has been such, like, my rock and my place of, like, refuge and peace. Like, especially when I lost my arm, I just think, mm -hmm. how did I have such peace? Like, I was so at peace with the situation. Really? Right afterwards, you were fine. Right after. Like, it's kind like of In bizarre. the ocean or, like, in the hospital? Like, kind of in the ocean and the hospital. In the ocean, you were like, okay. I was okay. very calm, and I was, even as a 13-year-old, I was, like, praying, like, God, help me get through this, like. In the ocean? In the ocean, like, while I'm, like, dying, you know? <laughs> like, 60% of the blood out, and... Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, and then in the hospital, I was really um, pretty at peace and just, like, okay with it. And my mom always kind of encouraged me to be thankful for just the fact that I was alive. And so I immediately kind of went into the whole scenario of, like, life is different now, but I'm thankful I'm alive. Like, right. there's so much more to life than the arm, you know? Like... <laughs> So I would say my mom taught me a lot about like just my like encouraging me and my faith in God and trusting that God has a greater plan for this and that good will come from yeah. this. And I look at it and I'm like, no doubt good has come from like what seems like such an awful thing. So imagine if all of us believe that like, hey, good's going to come from our terrible situation. We might get through our situations with more hope and like direction of that like something good is gonna come out of this. And it's like, I don't look back and think, oh, I wish I had my arm and I wish my life was way different. Like, I'm just happy with where I'm at. Yeah, that's inspiring. Thank you. Wow. And what about your dad? And my dad, he's like the super supporter. Mm -hmm. He's always been like, he came to my contest last week. Nice. Like, He's like, I'm not going to come to the premiere of Unstoppable, but I'm going to come to the contest the two weeks later. <laughs> He's just like, he wanted, he loves being a part of my surfing, especially, and he's a great grandpa too, but, and great dad, and, um, another thing my mom, t or both of them taught me a sense of adventure, mm. which is just so fun, like, I live life looking for, like, the next adventure, yeah. like, whether it's, like, going to the park in a few minutes or, like, going on some crazy surf trip. So they're so adventurous. Like, I'm going to go camping when I get home with my family. We're going, like, kayak camping, and we're just kind of, like, I've kept, in, they've ingrained that adventure spirit in me, and my mom's really, like, on the fly, spare the moment, whereas I'm kind of a planner, but then I'm also on the fly, spare the moment. I'm like, hon, let's do this. Like, let's go to trampoline world tomorrow, you know, like stuff yeah. like that. Like just go get some like energy out. Like, especially when we're in California, we're just like, where's the adventure? Like, <laughs> Drive on 405. Right, right. It's crazy. <laughs> Roller coaster. But uh, then we go home and we're like, okay, back to like outdoors chill. and chill beach adventure. and yeah, chill just adventure. adventure huh. mode. So I love that they t like gave me that. Mm. Like we grew up going camping all the time and just, they supported traveling and traveled the world once I started getting into competitive surfing and yeah, they were just amazing parents really. What's a, what's a lesson you wish they would have taught you? Ooh, maybe finances <laughs> and like <laughs> taxes and mm. stuff like that and I'm also thinking the school systems should teach that too but mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely going to make sure my kids graduate high school knowing like a little bit about finances, mm. taxes, like all the essential things. Did we you learn the hard way? Kind of, but I <clears throat> kind of just learned to like pay people to do it for me. Right, right. So I, ha I haven't had like bad scenarios. I just like wish they had taught me a little more of that. But then I'm also like, I should go teach them. Mm -hmm. so. Not that I have it all figured out, but... <laughs> Your boys are 18 and 23, oh, I guess, gosh. 22. What do you wish that you have taught them that they have now created in the world? Oh, I just hope they're content where they're at. Mm -hmm. I hope they're patient for a nice girl. Um, 
Maybe. I hope they're like living out their passions. Yeah. So I hope their job comes in something that really gives them like passion and drive and excitement. Uh, and that they're like gentlemen and that they have a sense of adventure. Sure. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's going to be so fun. I can't wait to be a grandma. So I already? hope they're being nice. <laughs> can't wait already to be a grandma? Yeah. How old are you now? I'm 29. 29. You want to be a grandmother already? No, I don't want to be a grandma already. I just look forward to being a grandma oh, someday. Okay. I think it'll be easier than motherhood. Really? <laughs> but like, it's going to be fun. I get to go like, go take the kids surfing and then like bring them home and be like, okay, you put Yours. them down for the nap. <laughs> On a scale of one to 10, 10 being the hardest. How hard is motherhood? Oh, it's the hardest thing for sure. I don't have a scale, but it's, but it's like the best things in life are often the hardest things. So think of that, weigh mm -hmm. that out, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the best thing, but it's also the hardest thing. Yeah. Because it like just keep, you're always kind of on, but they bring so much joy and excitement and adventure and challenge. And I think they make you a better human because mm -hmm. you just, you're now responsible for another little human. And yeah. they see every action that you take and they see every kind of, um, they, they're watching you all day long. So, yeah, there's been times where I, like, I wasn't dealing with stress well and just maybe my plate was a little overfilled and I could see Tobes. He was kind of worried about me, you know? Really? Like, But then we got past that and realized, okay, slow things down, like, mellow things out a bit, like, don't do too much, and it's okay now. But, you know, he's, like, watching everything and soaking it all up so it kind of challenges me to be thoughtful in everything mm. how do you prepare for day-to-day -day as a, a competitive athlete as a mom um uh, you know uh, a wife uh, running a business traveling the world how do you stay grounded with I, it all i and go surfing <laughs> that's how you stay grounded yeah, I know. There's a lot of things I do, but um, cuz it seems like a lot it seems like a lot of energy. Yeah. Right? And there's yeah. a lot of moms out there who have one, two, three, four kids and they've got a career and they've got a lot of things happening. Yeah. And I admire it because it's I don't know if I could do it. So how do you do it and prepare I know moms for it? are the ultimate multitaskers. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'll you know, I'm on social media and whatnot, and I try to be active in commenting back, but like I'll see comments of like, how do you do it all? Like, you're so amazing. And I'm like, well, I do have a husband and we teamwork everything. Mm -hmm. He's like full-time dad, but I'm also kind of full-time mom. Yeah. Like we really like live together every day and mm. we're very like, you know, we teamwork everything. So it's like, and plus we have a, a team of people that help us as well who are very like-minded and you know, involved every day. So it's kind of like just this ebb and flow of balance, but how, kind of how I prepare is just, you know, having some moments of quiet, um, praying, asking God to just guide the day. And um, I also feel really good when I just get a surf in, get in the yeah. ocean. The ocean definitely grounds me and like rejuvenates me. Um, having quality time with my husband that's not like work focused is really cool. We've been, doing um, dance lessons, like what we're learning like ballroom dancing, salsa? like salsa, um, rumba, waltz, yeah. and swing. Wow. So we're kind of tackling In those Kauai? four. Yeah. Wow. We have like a private dance instructor. She's amazing. Laura Bacelli, her dad I think is like some film person over here. But oh, okay. Yeah, it's so fun. So just finding things to kind of like where you can't think about what's going on. You know, surfing, it makes you present. Yeah. Like dancing, you're just thinking about moving and like learning your next step mm -hmm. and enjoying like my husband. So yeah, it's kind of just finding times to have quiet. We always like have coffee dates and yeah, and getting, like some, some, getting some exercise like, you know, really getting your workout in is really helpful, but that doesn't happen every day. Um, and then travel kind of throws everything off too. So mm -hmm. when you're traveling, just trying to find some like moments of just calm. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, okay, kids, like calm down. Like the four year old be like screaming, making all kinds <laughs> of noises. I'm like, no, we need like some peace right now. Like yeah. let's calm this down. <laughs> What's missing for you in your life? Ooh. Um, 
currently there's like we've just kind of come off of like a six year project of making my documentary unstoppable and so that was like a big undertaking and a lot of like it was a big passion project so we're kind of in a place of like re like directing the future path so like definitely the last six to nine months I had this feeling of like what am I reaching for like what am I doing right now like of course like yes I'm being mom and that's I'm constantly reaching for that but like I've always been a very goal centric Mm -hmm. person and like always working towards something and I am like still working on my surfing too but it just kind of went from like working so hard for like five years to and then like getting the film out and then it was just like this it felt weird I was like I do not feel comfortable right now with this like feeling and I have a friend who's like a integrative health doctor and he was in like him and his wife were in a similar situation too they're just like he just graduated more schooling and he's just like doesn't have a goal Mm kind of so kind of feeling goalless felt like really awkward Um, and I can't say I have a very clear goal now but yeah dabbling with some surf contests Mm -hmm. I'm competing I'm still like pushing my aerial game so it's like progressive surfing like like especially in the sport of women surfing like we aren't incredibly progressive um, above the wave surfing so doing airs and stuff but Mm -hmm. for sure 10 years from now like girls are going to be going crazy going to town so it's going to be really cool but so I've been pushing that aspect of my surfing and um, and then I'm working on some like kind of business like but I look at it as like business but it's more of like I mean, it's a lot of kind of the work you do, yeah. like empowering people yeah. to live their best life. So yeah. we've been working on this Unstoppable Year online of course, course. right. Sounds cool. Which I feel like young people are in this place of just constant distractions. Like they don't know who they are. They're constantly bombarded with not so positive messages on, on all the medias, mm-hmm. like social media, you know. And I think we're kind of in this weird era of like, what are they even gonna, like, what are these kids, like, who's our future leaders, kind of, like, they're just, I mean, I'm not like, I don't know, this might sound negative, but I just have a passion for young people and wanting to help them just find their boundaries, but also find their passions, goals, and like, how to reach them, how to like, get through life unstoppable, so to say. Um, So... I'm really excited about this course I've been working on. So that's kind of been like a big undertaking too. And we've been working hard on that, like my husband and team and I. So that's kind of the next like big goal. But oh yeah, I didn't even get to the question. You said what's missing, yeah? yeah? What's missing? Is oh. a goal is a big goal missing then? Yeah, I mean there's a sense of like my competitive surfing because like I would say of all the aspects of my surfing, competitive's more of my weaker side. And, like, with board sports, there's so many angles you can go at it. Mm-hmm. Like, you can be kind of, like, I've thought of myself as, like, a free surfer the last five years because I've just been going on, like, amazing surf trips. What's the, chasing, difference, free, like, what's the different types of things you can do in surfing? Free surfing, competitive surfing? Competitive surfing, like, there's hipster surfers, there's, like, big wave surfers, <laughs> okay. there's, gotcha. like, crazy slab surfers. Like You know, like, gotcha. there's all these different kind of genres within the sport. Um, but I've been kind of like working towards being the most like well-rounded so I'm like trying to tackle it all so to say like I kind of tackled it all the last five years um, or the last lifetime (laughs) (laughs) Um, so but like competitive I've had like amazing success at the same time but I'm also like I feel like there's room for more success in that area I just I don't know I'm still kind of like in this state of like not fully goal set it mm. like no goal is fully been set it's just like this feeling of like okay let's figure out what is it that I want like and then maybe head what that direction I'm still figuring it out like I mean of course I want to be successful in my sport but I'm also like I just like especially in my last two events we were like I just don't want to surf six inch waves mm. I want to surf like some decent waves so six foot waves yeah, six foot waves at least. Um, so, but the World Surfing League is so incredible right now, and I don't know. There's 
there's op opportunities. The opportunities are endless. It's just like zeroing in on what I want, and I yeah. just don't have that fully dialed in. I'm yeah. just. But it's okay to have. I think it's okay to have a time of like figuring things out and like not having the goal. Like take a little break, take a little breather, like just have fun. Like, and I'm still like working on so many things and like have the kids full time. Like gotta change the diaper probably in like two hours from now. <laughs> so it's just like it's busy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. But yeah, as, as far as something missing. I mean, I could see more babies down the road, so it's like, really? like, I don't feel like the family's complete, which is crazy. When I had our first kid, and then our second kid wasn't conceived yet, we were like, ready. We were like, okay, second kid. Come Already, on. wow. You want another kid now? Not, not now. <laughs> the little one's like, just barely sleeping through the night, so it's like, let's like get a, a, a little year bit of, of peace sleep, for a, couple a year hours. of sleep first. Like, I thrive on good sleep, and I have not had that for, like, four years. So sure. let's have a year of good sleep and then go from there. How many years do you think you can be competitive for? Well, have you heard of Kelly Slater? He's, like, 40 Have right? you heard of, of him? Of course, yeah. I've actually been messaging. Have you talked to him? We've been messaging back and forth on Instagram. Yeah, he'd be amazing. He, he said he wants to come on the show, but I, he's not in L.A. for a while, so... Or maybe he is now, I'm not sure. But. He will be a fun conversation. Yeah. That guy's amazing. He's like 40-something, right? He's like pushing 50. He's a machine. He's like, what, 12, 15-time so world like, champion? So it's like, who's to say, like, who's to cut off the, like, it's true. pushing your surfing? I mean, he's, I think of him frequently, and I'm like, okay, well, we still got some time. You got time. Is he a good yeah. friend of yours? You know a lot and of And I'm people? like, no, I'm not, like, super tight with him. <laughs> but, like, I mean, we would sit down and chat, you know, but <clears throat> sure. not, like, best friends, you know. But um, he, I would say like the last five years since podcasts were inve invented. And actually, if I had your podcast downloaded, I just haven't listened to it really. You listened <laughs> you to know, one recently. I was like, oh, I want to listen to this. And then I just never really got around to it. But it's been in my like podcast. Oh, good. I like it. I know, no. I, like I really enjoyed like, we listened to a bunch of your short ones. I love that cool. you do short ones because some of these yeah. guys, like they only do an hour and a half yeah. or... I'm like, I don't have time for an hour and a half, oh, yeah. but if it's really good, I'll like, you know, charge it or like find a time. Sure. But um, yeah, I was super stoked on some of your stuff. It's just like good to hear like encouraging, yeah. encouraging um, words. That's right. Um, well, that's what you're trying to do with your course too, right? Yeah, exactly. Is, so, it, is it designed for, for younger people, for older people? Is well, it I mean, kids? I is think it? anyone could do it, but sure. I definitely like have a heart for teenagers and yeah. young adults. I think it's just such a time of like figuring yourself out, figuring life out, and, um, you know, teaching these. I mean, I don't know if grit can fully be taught, but like teaching them. Isn't some, that interesting? It's, yeah. You know, everyone's talking about grit. Yeah. And the TED Talk and the books and all these things, but it's like, it's like as an athlete growing up, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. No, no. Like, I was talking with someone just recently about how they're like, oh, I got so pounded in the ocean and then I was over it. I was like, I guess when I was little, I would go and get pounded for fun. Like, that was right. what we did. So <clears throat> my grit was like, I got taught to enjoy being pounded as like a five, like, seven year old. Eight, so you fall in love with the pain <laughs> of your sport or the thing that you're into. The, yeah. the pain of like your, your passion that you're into. I remember playing, you know, basketball, football, baseball growing up, and it was just like, how much pain could I endure as a kid? It was fun still, but it was like, okay, it's not enough. I've got to like keep shooting, I keep training, I keep working out. I loved it so much and I wanted to be better. Yeah. I think you've got to have that for whatever the thing you want to be doing. Like, I still have that I want to be better. Yeah. So I think that keep continually drives me. And then there's this whole movement now. I think with the internet and, like, phone access, there's the whole movement of, like, uh, longevity health. Mm -hmm. So there's, like, you can constantly <clears throat> be educating yourself on all that and, like, doing stuff to, like, you know, I'm, like, really into just natural good health. And mm -hmm. so... I'm like, well, I guess I could, like, keep myself young, like, a little bit longer. Sure. And I've, like, had two kids, so I've gotten past that. Like, mm -hmm. that to me is, like, if I had another kid, it's, like, fine, you know? <laughs> um, so it's just, like, yeah, it's, um, I feel like there's still a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> but, and I'm very motivated that regardless of if I'm, like, a professional surfer, I want to just surf well and, like, be able to surf really well as long yeah. as I can. Um, like, as a grandma. <laughs> there you go. 
So there's a lot of like kind of, I have like grandma goals. <laughs> grandma goals already. I love it. What was more painful for you, having a baby or having the oh. accident? Oh, for sure, having the baby. It's more oh painful than the accident? Childbearing, and I did all natural, like, you know, nothing, nothing. Then a shark biting your arm off? Shark bites are so traumatic that your body goes into shock. You Haven't you feel, heard that? You can't even feel it. It's just like, uh... Yeah, for sure, like, childbearing. You're going through hours and hours and hours of, like, severe, like, crazy cramping that is, like, you feel like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> but so you it's know more you're not. painful having a, a baby yeah. than having your arm bitten off by a shark. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Was there yeah. ever pain afterwards? Like when you were actually allowed your I, mind to calm yeah, down? Yeah, I'm so like, really thankful. Like I had a little bit of what they call um, phantom pain. So right now worst, I right? have phantom feeling. So it's like I can feel my hand down there, no my way. fingers, my wrist especially. You can feel it? Yeah, I can feel it. Like my nerves, like nerves have that feel. remembrance or whatever, wow. but it doesn't hurt. So I call it phantom feeling because some people, but some people, it's really unfortunate. It's really they painful. have like severe pain. I think it somehow has to do with how the nerves were lacerated or whatever. It's crazy. Okay, we're getting a little too gory here, but um, <laughs> yeah. So I know some. I've had like I've met a lot of amputees and um, yeah. people who have been through traumatic injuries and they have to take drugs to kind of deal with that pain because it's That's really, tough. so I'm so thankful. I'm like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. I, like everything came clean. But um, yeah, it's child rearing is no joke. Like, but the thing is, <sighs> as a woman, you know your body can do this. Yeah. God has created your body to bear children. Like you can do it. So it's like kind of like mentally preparing it. To me, like being an athlete, I've heard athletes can have a hard time because they have a hard time letting go of like, you know, control, but so you I surrender almost. Right? Yeah, you have to just let go. But um, it's kind of like being in the wave too. Yeah, so I I think I did a good job of letting go because both my births went really good. Oh, and that's good. Yeah, the pain is over now. I, I'm probably <laughs> gonna forget about it in a year or two, and then have another. Go. Wow. But yeah, some women have really traumatic births that are so hard, and so I have a lot of compassion. I'm like, mm -hmm. finally, you once you've had a kid, you like understand women so much yeah, more because it's like, wow. You just anyway. have a level of respect, yeah, for your mom. You're like, I love yes. you. You're amazing. Yeah. Or like the people who have like a ton of kids, you're, you're like, like, oh my gosh, you're incredible. <laughs> like, how do you do that? <laughs> Unless they're just like drugging up and like they don't feel it. Okay, then like, like no, well, they're still like that's still amazing too. <laughs> still hard, like, yes. <laughs> Well, you've got your movie out right now. How long is it out for? It's called uh, Unstoppable, right? Unstoppable. It's out now July, August 1st. Yeah. I think it's one of the last weekends. Okay. So. And then eventually it'll be online, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully like we don't Netflix know. or Prime, you never know. But people can go to your website to learn more about that and the course. Where can they go to learn more about it? Yeah, everything? at bethanyhamilton.com. And yeah, the Unstoppable year is going to be awesome. I hope it's... Or I believe it's going to be life-changing for myself and everyone who does it. So. When's it coming out? We're starting this summer, fall, like September-ish. Okay. And it'll be so. on your website. They can sign up to learn more yeah, about it. Yeah, just can... head to the website and you'll get all the information there. Okay, and cool. Yeah, I'm really pumped to just share my life and all the things I've learned along the way with people. And yeah, I've been in this place of kind of inspiring people since I was 13 years old. Uh -huh. And then now I'm kind of stepping into that role of equipping and just really giving more. Educating more, yeah. yeah. What is something about you that most people don't know Ooh. that you're really proud of? Ooh. I don't know. Uh, I have a prosthetic arm that helps me play ukulele. No way. Yeah. That's cool. But I broke it, so I gotta like send it in for repair. <laughs> so right now it's like kind of down, and I'm not really good at ukulele, but I can like strum a song. Wow, that's cool. I love the ukulele. Me too. That's and cool. I grew up playing um, uh, guitar and ukulele, so that felt really hard for me when I lost my arm. That was mm. one of the harder challenges because I was like passionately in love with like music making and like just loved just picking it up and playing a song and like so yeah finally i went and got a prosthetic to just see what it'd be like cool. and it was a little awkward like it didn't feel completely natural yeah, but it's still really fun like yeah. it felt like i definitely had some tears at some point so that's cool 
That's like a fun little like side project I've had in the last couple of years. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, this question is called the three truths. So I want you to imagine that you're the great great grandmother that you dream of being, <laughs> and that you're so excited to be, um, and it's your and you've created everything you want to create in your life. You've accomplished all the dreams, all the big goals you set. You make them happen. You've got the family of your dreams. You've done it all. But you've got to take everything with you. So whatever you created, your books, your movies, your, the things you put out in the world, you've got to take it with you. So no one has access to your information anymore. All your social media content, yeah. it's all gone now. Yeah. But you get to write down on your last day the three things you know to be true about your life and the lessons that you would leave behind. And this is all people would have to kind of remember you by are these, these lessons. What would you say are your three truths? Oh my gosh. Uh, is it the things I want? Do you want or people to it... like, there's like, you know, always be honest. Here's a lesson, here's yeah. a truth. Like, I'll always give your best. Or Okay, one an of example. the first things that came to mind was like faithfulness. Mm -hmm. um, be faithful in what? Just to the people in my life and mm -hmm. to God. Um, and then my Second, oh gosh, this is deep. I feel like I need to put like some months of thought into this. You can come back in the future and let me know, but for okay. what's on the top of your mind? You know, three things you'd want to leave behind, yeah. Um, maybe, can I bring surfing with? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think just having a sense of peace. Well, these are the things that I kind of cherish. I don't know. I don't really care like what people like remember me as. I always get that question. I'm just like whatever, like whatever like empowers them, you know. Yeah. Um, what would you want them to lesson? Would you want them to know? Oh, I think that we can be unstoppable, mm -hmm. um, no matter what the challenges that come our way. And I mean, I always think of like, wow. Well, I mean, I've fen faced an immense amount of challenge, but some people have faced a lot more and a lot more pain. And I really take that to heart and know that, like, maybe I don't fully understand all the pains of the world, mm -hmm. but I just believe that, like. In my own life, my passions have driven me to overcome, and that's my faith in God and surfing and now my family, and these are the things that continually push me forward. Um, so I hope that people can find their passion to yeah. overcome their challenges. And um, Does that count as one? Give me one more, yeah. That was, I saw, the first one was be faithful. Okay. Second one I, I heard was be unstoppable. Okay. So that kind of like goes in the unstoppable category. Uh -huh. uh, oh gosh. Third one. Um, just enjoy the moment and like get some adventure in you. Mm, okay. So what I'm hearing is be present and adventure. I like it. Yoo-hoo. So good. <laughs> I feel like those are what you've been representing for a long time. Cool. Adventure, like you have to be present when you're on the waves. And yeah, it's funny. Yourself. Like I've noticed with like social media, <laughs> I like try to do something funny, and people will, will comment like on the funny thing. They'll comment, "You're so inspirational." <laughs> like, Wait, I'm trying to be funny here, like not inspirational. <laughs> That's good. So it's just funny how it's like you can't really change people's perceptions yeah. of you, even if. I mean, no what you do. part of making my film unstoppable was actually to like be like, hey, like I'm way more than just like the shark attack survivor girl, mm -hmm. like the shark bite girl, because I'll be called like weird stuff like that. I'm like, hey, like look at my surfing, or right. now I'm mom. Like, either way, I'm just Bethany. But <laughs> yeah, well, I want to acknowledge you, Bethany, for your inspiration because you have done so much for so many people, especially young girls who I think look up to you. You continue to be yourself, you continue to bring a lot of joy, and you're just grateful for your life. And I think that is a powerful message that everyone can have, no matter what adversity, challenge uh, comes our way, like continuing to pursue the passion that you have is inspiring a lot of people. So I acknowledge you for your, your childlike joy. You just have like <laughs> a pure joy about you, and it's, it's really cool to connect and meet you. So Thank you, Louis. That. Of course, yeah. Fun chatting. It's fun chatting. I have a final question for you, and that's what's your oh. definition of greatness? Oh, uh, I think just kind of loving 
loving or making the most of what you've got and just like loving life and enjoying it. <laughs> Amazing, Bethany. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. you rock. Not just a dream, because to me, I feel like a dream feels very distant, but a vision for now, a healthy vision for now. At 22, you're kind of still taking things as they come. Yes. And yet to say, no, I need to really take ownership of the vision of my life, I think allows you to begin making decisions in that direction.